have another Emmanuel and David and Ricardo. So guys, please um, activate your webcam uh, and your your microphone. Uh, so this is our final uh, presentation. And let me introduce uh, these uh, three gentlemen from the Politic uh, Politecnico di Milano. So Emmanuel Tomasi has a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering uh, with an ongoing uh, master in space engineering at the Politecnico di Milano and uh, is a mission analyst for the 6S uh, CubeSat mission in Polyspace since December 2021. Uh, Davide uh, Belisco is a master student in space engineering Politecnico di Milano and, and president and, uh, of the uh, CubeSat and CubeSat system engineers at the uh, Polyspace Student Space Association. And Ricardo Rambaldi has uh, a bachelor in aerospace engineering currently at the, in the last year of masters in uh, uh, space engineering, uh, both at Politecnico di Milano uh, and also an ex-board member of the Space Association uh, uh, Polyspace uh, and system engineer for the 6S uh, CubeSat project. And uh, yeah, without further ado, I leave the stage to you guys uh, and uh, please start uh, the sharing of your screen. Yes, thank you very much, Stefan. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for attending our talk. We're a group of uh, master's students in uh, space engineering, and today we're going to present you the work we carried out in the framework of our university module in uh, system engineering and operations at Polytechnic in Milano, in which we used uh, Kabbalah software and Arcadia method to perform the reverse engineering of a very well-known space mission, which is, is a Mars Express mission that has been flown some 20 years ago. So this is about uh, reverse engineering, which means that basically we started from the data available in the literature about the, the mission and, and, and the spacecraft. And we went through a preliminary design of all the subsystems and, and the mission, the trajectory of this mission, as we will have a, a glance on this, uh, about this later on in the presentation. And finally, the, the objective of this was to uh, retrieve and derive the requirements for every subsystem and, and, and the mission itself. Before starting, I wanted to thank to acknowledge our colleague uh, Paolo Minacapilli for being precursor of the MBSC approach and, and Kabbalah uh, method uh, at, at our university. And from his thesis, this work is based on and, and takes a lot from. So we can proceed with the outline of our presentation. We're going to start by giving uh, an introduction to the mission we are going to analyze about its objectives and architecture. And then we're going to go through the core of our presentation, which is how we use the Arcadia method and uh, NCAPELA tool to, to perform our, uh, our work. Finally, we are going to go through fast about some computations uh, about the preliminary sizing of the components of our spacecraft and eventually we're going to conclude uh, with uh, some considerations. So moving on to uh, an introduction to the mission is a Mars Express mission at the objective to monitor all aspects of the Martian environment. This means uh, that we include in these days of surface, surface, atmosphere of, of Mars, and also to take pictures of its moons, which are Phobos and Deimos. And the main goal was to search for evidence of extinct or existing uh, life on the planet. From this, we can already derive some, some, some scientific objectives uh, directly from, from the statement that has been uh, retrieved uh, from, from literature. So we can, for example, uh, list them in, uh, as we have done in the slide, and they include the global, global mapping of Mars surface, the study of the composition and circulation of its atmosphere, the surface morphology, and many others, including the mapping of, of distribution of water 
on the crust and the flybys uh, about uh, the Martian moons. And last but not least, the in situ investigation, which means that something had to land on the on the planet's surface as, as it happened. And then the near Mars plasma and natural gas environment study and the study of the interaction between the solar wind and the atmosphere of the planet. And here, uh, summarize the uh, architecture of the mission by, by ESA. So you can see the, the spacecraft departs from Earth. And after some time, it reaches Mars. But before reaching Mars, it releases a lander, Beagle 2, which you can see in the illustration, which is going to land uh, on the surface while the satellite is going to continue its uh, interplanetary trajectory and finally inject into an orbit around Mars to continue its observation. And so before the preliminary sizing of the subsystems, we can already exploit the Capella software to, to compose some, some diagrams about the requirements of the mission. These are uh, operational architecture blank diagrams in which uh, you can see some of the requirements we derive for, for the mission itself. And we divided them in category, categories according to the space standards, the ECSS. And you can see some of them, including the cost of the mission, which shall not exceed uh, 300 million euros, the, the launch windows, the main functionality uh, that the mission has to perform, and environmental uh, regulations uh, about the space environment, which the satellite has, of course, to, to survive. And here are a couple of slides about the scientific instruments uh, and the satellite uh, at on board. It's not really to go in detail uh, about uh, all of them. This is just to have uh, the idea that the mission was complex and we had several payloads uh, both on the satellite and on the lander but most importantly each of these payload each of these instrument was there for a reason that was to fulfill uh, one of the previous objectives that we outlined uh, outlined uh, in uh, in the previous slides so for example you could see that the high resolution stereo camera payload was there to perform surface morphology investigation as well as the Mars's payload while the SPICAM was there to study the composition of the atmosphere and the, the interaction of the atmosphere with the solar wind. And finally, the analysis of space plasma and energetic atoms was used to characterize the plasma and neutral gas environment. Again, some other instruments on the right, you can see uh, also those of the lander, which was uh, Beagle 2 and the objectives that are related to it and, and the rationale. So again, using Capella, using Capella software, we can retrieve a diagram with, uh, that summarizes the requirements for all our, our pellets. The image is a bit tiny. You are not supposed to be able to read all of them. Maybe I can point out some of them such as that the system shall be able to perform in situ measurements of the soil oxidizing capability and that the system shall pe perform in orbit measurements for at least a Martian year and all uh, these kind of requirements that have been derived from, from studying the data present in the literature. And so, uh, before outlining the, the approach we used uh, in regards with uh, model-based system engineering, I wanted to mention that uh, basically with this work to the, the final goal of this work, after we derived the requirement for every subsystem, was to justify the design choices that the system engineers and, and specialists uh, that dealt with the mission 20 years ago uh, did while uh, while designing uh, the the platform. So going on with the approach we used, uh, we exploited only some of Capella features. As you can see in the in the slide, these are the four steps in uh, in modeling a system with uh, with Cap with Capella. So going from the operational analysis, in which you 
you capture the the needs from from the stakeholders to the system analysis in which you identify the the system to the logical architecture and physical architecture actually our task our work only needed the first two so the operational analysis and the system analysis so in the following we're going to detail uh, more the useful the diagrams that we found useful uh, in capella and how we use them to to model our our complex system okay so let's start from the operational analysis which as from capella definition on the on the on the first page of the software it's it, it, it aims at capturing and consolidating the operational needs from stakeholders to define what the users of the system have accomplished and to identify entities, actors, roles, activities, and concepts. Okay, so the first thing we do is to create an operational entity breakdown diagram to list all the actors and entities, so human and non-human stakeholders, and specify in case if they are included in uh, themselves. So uh, we have ESA, the European Space Agency, the, the, main, the main partner of the mission, the, the launcher, which uh, you use to, to launch the, the satellite, the ITU, which is an entity that basically allocate the bandwidth for a very precise bandwidth, uh, very precise range of frequencies to perform your communications between Earth and, and, and the spacecraft. And then all the scientific communi community and space industries, uh, environment, uh, and mission operations center. Second diagram we used is the operational capabilities diagram, which you use to defend the capabilities of your, of your system and specify the relationship with the uh, with the actors and entities which you defined uh, in uh, in the previous slides so some ca capabilities we 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 spotted are uh, for example to deliver the payload to earth orbit and this is done of course by the launcher the, the rocket on, on board uh, of which you, you mount your your satellite to perform uh, space operations which is done by the mission operation center to perform the scientific mission, which is done by ESA, and many, many others, such as assign the communication frequencies done by the ETO, and to develop and enter the, the payload by, by agencies and institutions and industries, of course. So at this point, we have to define all the scenarios in which our, our mission is gonna, is gonna operate in, so to do so we use the operational entity scenarios in uh, in uh, capella the oes diagrams we define a bunch of these uh, for example in the first one you can see the the workflow that uh, goes from collecting the data to analyzing it and all the actors that are involved in this and the same for each of the capabilities we we saw in the in the previous slides so about uh, assigning the the communication bandwidth you have the ITU that establishes establishes the availability of frequencies and and gives a precise range to to the partners of the mission to, to be used during uh, during communication and again some more scenarios that uh, you have to define in order to model the system. For example, on the right, you can see the workflow that goes from the design of the payload to uh, the integration on, on the satellite and the development of the whole uh, space segment, which is the platform, the satellite itself. And again, a lot of more scenarios, including uh, that uh, relating the operations of the mission operation uh, mission operation center which is responsible for generating the commands to be sent to to the spacecraft and and to to command the the spacecraft to, to achieve its objectives 
And so uh, the last step of our operation analysis consists in, uh, in uh, detailing some operational architecture diagrams, which are useful to highlight some uh, functional chains, uh, such as, uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, the in-orbit mission life cycle, which uh, follows the blue, the blue set of arrows and goes from the design of the payload all, uh, all, all along through the launch of it to the to, to, to reaching Mars orbit and to perform uh, operations around around Mars. Instead, on the right on the left, you can see the functional chain which regulates telecommunications, which says basically that you have first to generate a command, then to send it to the space, spacecraft, so you can have the spacecraft uh, actually doing it. And in the second slide inside, you can see the uh, in situ uh, mission life cycle, which is that that is undergone by the land that lands uh, on, on the Mars surface. And so it lives uh, there and performs uh, another scientific mission, which is different from, from that of the spacecraft. And now I leave the word to my colleague Emanuele. Hi all, uh, nice to be here at Capilla Days and I'm going to continue the um, David's words about the uh, operational analysis, talking about the system analysis and uh, what we had to achieve at the end of this uh, uh, of the system analysis in order to proceed uh, with uh, all the reverse engineering of the subsystems that uh, um, were part of the Mars, Ex Mars Express mission. So uh, the goal of the system analysis is to identify the boundary of the system and to consolidate uh, requirements. The end goal that uh, we had for the system analysis was to produce the um, data flow diagram in which all the functions of the missions were uh, Mm, listed so that we could uh, use them as a justification for all the design services uh, that were made for the uh, subsystem that we later identified uh, during our uh, reverse engineering process. So the first thing, the first thing we did was to uh, identify the system actors and the capabilities of the mission. Um, all uh, the entities uh, that uh, David previously mentioned, such as uh, ESA, the industries, the launcher, the scientific institutions, and uh, going on, are now become uh, actors uh, so that we can link uh, the capabilities and the main missions uh, that we identified could be linked uh, to them. So, uh, here in this slide, in the right side, we can see that we uh, found three main missions from the uh, literature and the data that we had available, which are the provide support, keep uh, the space segment safe, and to perform the scientific mission. So these were the main missions, and uh, they can be further described by all the capabilities that are linked to them. I can go into much uh, details uh, uh, later on in this uh, presentation, but uh, just to note that all these missions and capabilities can be linked to the actors, such as the Mission Operation Center, the environment, and the, particularly ESA, that are here shown uh, in the diagram. Uh, the, singular, the single capabilities that uh, were listed uh, uh, before can now be further described by the functions that uh, relate to the system and that the system had to uh, accomplish in order to complete uh, the mission. So uh, uh, each of the capabilities can be described by uh, a number of functions. For example, the approach marks capability uh, can be described by the functions that are estimate the relative state uh, uh, to the planet, 
between the satellite and the planet, and to execute uh, the relative maneuvers to um, reach the planet and insert into the um, nominal orbit for the uh, scientific operations. As well as, for example, collect data. How do you collect data? You have to check, to check the instrument's uh, status, see that uh, everything works. You have to calibrate the instruments. And then finally, you have to operate the instruments. Then uh, all this uh, process is linked to, for example, the provide on board the data handling function here in the left uh, uh, bottom side, where you have to process data, store data, and prepare data for transmissions. So I will not go into detail of, about uh, every capability, but just to show uh, you a couple of them. We have the provide propulsion, provide protection against mechanical loads, provide power supply. Uh, all these three capabilities can be described by functionalities such as generate power, store energy, regulate power, or uh, uh, distribute, uh, lastly, power. This is the last uh, set of uh, capabilities. Um, and then uh, after all this uh, process that we have done by uh, analyzing all the literature that we had uh, available about the mass express mission, uh, we listed all the functions in the diagram called the root system function. Uh, here you can see that uh, we have uh, the three main missions in uh, yellow, which are the provide support, performance scientific mission, space segment safe. And uh, in green, we have the uh, functions of the system that were previously listed. Uh, now mm, I can show you just a couple of slides to see how they are uh, created. So uh, we have the provide support, that is uh, uh, first described by provide power supply, propulsion, uh, communication, uh, data handling, and so on, the performance scientific mission, and lastly, the keep uh, space segment safe. So this is the end product of uh, the reverse engineering done uh, in to Capella. Now, to, in order to have uh, description of the mission and a uh, project, reverse project of the mission, we have to go into much details uh, in every subsystem that uh, the uh, Mars Express uh, had. So what uh, I will tell you now is the mission analysis subsystem, which for uh, the space missions is one of the most uh, uh, particular because it implies uh, the orbit optimization, the trajectory optimization. So it is different from uh, every other, uh, let's say, project that uh, you can normally uh, perform here on Earth. Uh, so for the mission analysis reverse engineering, we divided the, the process into three main steps, the near Earth uh, phase, the deep space phase, and the near Mars phase. And uh, each of these phases had a similar reverse engineering process. Uh, for the near Earth, we always start from the literature to find uh, uh, data such as Depart to Date, Launch Site, Launch User Manual. We then proceed with uh, our calculations about uh, uh, retrieving, uh, for example, the initial parking orbit, the escape maneuver that the Mars Express had to perform. And uh, we arrived at the final step of this uh, phase with the data that we can then uh, compare to the uh, to the data found from literature, uh, such as the orbit parameters and the maneuvers that uh, were executed. Same uh, procedure for deep space. So you find uh, the time between the departure and the arrival on Mars. Uh, you find the number of uh, TCMs, which are trajectory correction uh, maneuvers that were executed in the interplanetary phase. And 
then you compute the, these maneuvers in order to arrive uh, at a precise time and a precise uh, attitude uh, and position with respect uh, to Mars. And uh, you have as final product the um, maneuvers that uh, Mars Express had to accomplish. Same for the near Mars, you start from the part, from arrival date and the type of maneuvers to insert into the final operational orbit, and you compute all the maneuvers for the inclination change of the orbit, from the shape change of the orbit, and you have uh, at, the, at the final step the maneuvers executed and the uh, final orbit that uh, the Mars Express had to accomplish. Uh, finally, after this process, we compared the data that we found in the previous slides with uh, the end product and the data that uh, ESA shared for the mission. And uh, uh, we then checked that uh, every, um, every data that we arrived had a small relative error with respect to the real data executed, so we proceeded with the uh, justification of all the design choices and with the effects that uh, this particular subsystem had to all the other subsystems in order to continue with the, the, the reverse engineering process and the design going on with the design process. Um, so uh, here you can see a part of the uh, root system function diagrams in which we highlighted the functions of, that we previously identified uh, that mainly mm, had an effect on the mission analysis subsystem that we just analyzed, which are, for example, here uh, in red, we have the perform, perform orbital control, approach Mars, execute relative maneuvers, and uh, the perform collision avoidance maneuvers. Um, Okay, so uh, the following step was to use also the requirements that uh, David uh, described to you before, and to so identify which of these requirements had an effect on mission analysis. And just as, uh, as, as I just said, in uh, red, with a red square around, you can see the requirements uh, that uh, influence the design choices just, uh, such as the compliance with uh, the launcher specifications, uh, such as the mission duration, uh, such as the um, ability of the mission to land and perform uh, Martian uh, surface operations, and going on. Same, pro same uh, process for the mission objectives. So. Uh, why we decided to have a polar orbit or an orbit with an high eccentricity or with an high major axis? Because the uh, MAX, Mars Express, had to accomplish planet observation, communication with the ground station on Earth. So you needed an high eccentricity to be uh, at an altitude high enough from Mars to be able to see the Earth and communicate with the Earth. And uh, why did we need a lander? because we had to uh, perform in situ investigations. And so we had to optimize the trajectory of the mission to be able to uh, let the Mars Express, and in particular the lander, be equal to, to land on Mars. Lastly, um, we can retrieve a series of requirements that uh, uh, the mission analysis subsystems uh, had to, let's say, impose on the other subsystems. Uh, I can list some of you, some of these to you, such as uh, uh, the system had to land with uh, no damages to the Mars uh, surface. Uh, the orbit had to remain the same for at least one Martian year and going on. It is not necessary to list uh, all, the, all of the requirements because some of them are very technical and are not useful to so explain why Capella was really useful to us. 
So now I can just uh, uh, let uh, Ricardo uh, talk about uh, all the other subsystems and uh, bring to you some conclusions about uh, our reverse uh, gene editing process and uh, why Capella was really useful uh, to us. Hi, hello everybody. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Emanuele. So um, the reverse engineering process, uh, which Emanuele just explained, was then employed for all the other subsystems of the Mars Express. And I will go briefly through every one of them. Starting from the EPS, the electric power subsystem, the power consumption of uh, all the components of the spacecraft was evaluated, considering a nominal condition and a worst case condition. This led to a requirement on the amount of power that the EPS shall ensure in all the different phases. Then we could compute the battery's capacity and the area of the solar panels. After that, we retrieved some design effects, which have an impact on the design of the other subsystems. Uh, for example, the thermal control subsystem, the TCS, uh, shall dissipate all the heat created by the electric power. And uh, here, in, here in the next slide, we can see all the requirements which guided us through the sizing of this subsystem. Uh, one important driver of this, um, of this design, uh, and mainly for the design of the architecture of the EPS, was the fact that the spacecraft needed to receive power both in the sunlight and eclipse phase. So we needed to include batteries in the EPS architecture. So for the attitude control system, uh, we analyzed the needed accuracy in all the phases and the loads on the structure during the control maneuvers. So we could select the architecture and to compute the mass and power budget of the subsystem. I'm talking about uh, mass budget in this case because the ADCS architecture included thruster, thrusters which uh, consume a propellant mass. Uh, this last thing is actually an important design effect on the propulsion system which uh, shall include uh, this amount of uh, propellant mass in the mass budget computed in the prop propulsion subsystem sizing. And uh, one of the main driver for uh, this uh, sizing was uh, the needed degree of freedoms uh, during each phase of the missions. For uh, the propulsion subsystem, we use the delta Vs retrieved uh, from the mission analysis, and we computed the amount of propellant mass needed, and we could size the tanks. Moreover, we were able to compute uh, the pressurant mass, uh, which is used to pressurize the propellant tanks and uh, its tank. In this case, we found some design effects uh, and uh, one important for the structure and configuration subsystem was the fact that uh, the propellant tanks uh, needed uh, uh, structure as support. In this case, uh, an important uh, um, an important driver for this sizing, as I mentioned before, was the fact that the propulsion subsystem shall be capable of doing uh, attitude control maneuvers. So uh, thrusters shall be included in the propulsion subsystem architecture. Then we analyzed the amount of data to transmit for the telecommunication subsystem. And so we were able to select the system's capacity and justify the chosen antennas. In this case, one important design effect on the attitude control subsystem was uh, the fact that uh, the, there is uh, uh, the high gain antenna needed a fine attitude in order to work well. And uh, an important driver for this uh, sizing uh, was, uh, for example, the band that uh, was needed in order to communicate uh, from the orbiter to the lander. So after that, we almost finished uh, with these overviews of the subsystem. We have the thermal control subsystem. 
In this case, we have uh, considered the worst case scenarios, both for the minimum and maximum temperature. And uh, then we could propose a possible architecture and some possible coatings for the exteriors, in addition to justify the, the real ones. Uh, in this case, an important uh, effect on the EPS was the amount of power needed uh, in, for, the, um, for the thermal control subsystem in order to work. And uh, an important requirement that is always important when you have uh, cameras and sensors on board in your spacecraft, uh, you have to design the thermal control subsystem uh, by evaluating the range of temperatures in which uh, all the sensors, all the cameras um, should work. So this was a really main driver for this uh, sizing. Then um, having sized all the subsystem, we reconstructed the final design through a 3D drawing software as seen in this slide. And uh, we had to consider some requirements for the configuration. For example, it was necessary to avoid the shadow on the solar panels from, for example, the antennas. So we started from the right side of the V diagram, and then we were able through a reverse engineering process uh, to design all the subsystem, considering the requirements effect between them. And uh, we were able to justify all the design choices of the actual mission. Justifying all these choices helped us to understand the complex practices behind the space mission design. We could see the mutual effects uh, between the subsystems and how it was possible to trace each decision taken to a precise requirement underlining the importance of uh, uh, listing and uh, writing all these requirements. The Capella model-based system engineering tool helped us to keep track and visualize all the requirements more easily, in addition to understanding and underlining the correlation between the subsystem and the entities through the operational and functional diagrams. So we, I need to, to say that at the beginning, it was a steep path of learning, but after that, we were able to use a software which gave us all the tools needed to support the system engineering work for space mission design. Thank you so much for your attention. I leave our contacts on the slide if needed, and if you have any questions, we will answer to them. Thank you, guys. Um... Thank you for this presentation. I, I don't see any question in the Q&A yet. Uh, so uh, if, if uh, any of the attendees uh, has some questions for, for, for you guys, uh, don't hesitate to, to put it in, in the Q&A. Um, I've got one question, uh, which is, uh, you said you were able to understand and justify uh, the choices that that were uh, made in this mission um, I, i'm curious if you were able to find some choices that 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 were not that easy to justify and and if you find some you know uh, way of doing things differently optimizing them maybe i don't know well um this is a very common question uh, very common question i can say um and the answer is yes yes we find uh, in particular one uh, very big choice uh, regarding the trajectory of the of the mission uh, that implied the fact that uh, the original trajectory had to uh aim directly at Mars in order to uh, let uh, the lander, um, let's say, land on the Mars surface. And uh, before uh, uh, crashing uh, onto Mars, the lander had a parachute uh, that was uh, deployed for the, um, for the landing process, and uh, the orbiter had to perform some maneuvers before crashing uh, in order to inject on the, onto the Mars uh, operational orbit. 
Uh, but uh, during this procedure, the lander mm, never communicated with the orbiter. And uh, so it is, uh, so we can presume that the lander crashed into the Mars surface as we never received information uh, uh, about it. So maybe uh, we thought that uh, aiming directly at Mars uh, was a, a great choice for the optimization of the trajectories and the propellant used. But uh, uh, maybe there were some, uh, uh, let's say, procedures that were not considered for the for a safe uh, injection into Mars. So maybe aiming for a different point uh, or for a different uh, point in space. And then uh, uh, after the orbiter was safe around the orbit, release the lander and uh, uh, let it um, land on Mars surface with a parachute in safety and not just uh, throwing it uh, into the surface. So this was the main uh, choice that uh, let us uh, surprised. OK, thanks. <laughs> Great feedback. Um, OK, so we've got a bunch of questions now. So very interesting work, guys. Did you document it in a paper from Phyllis? Hi, Phyllis. Yes, actually, we wrote a report on it. Uh, we're going to share it soon on our LinkedIn pages. So if you want to have a look at it, you can just uh, follow us on LinkedIn. We're going to publish it. Uh, in these days. Okay. Thank you. And the next question: uh, Did you miss any functionality in Capella that would really help doing the reverse engineering work? <laughs> Computational <laughs> capabilities, but I mean, probably the software was it's not supposed to do so. So, I mean, uh, a coherent. I mean. Uh, all in one software for, for our purposes would have been better, but we were not looking at, at Capella for this. So, Right, right. OK, question from Laurent. What were the stakes of your study? Are there any expectation from any space agency or another entity? So I'm not sure I understand the question. Maybe my colleagues. Uh... It, 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 so I can maybe rephrase it. And so by stakes, I think Laurent means, you know, why did you do that? What 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 was the goal? And 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 then, did you do it in any relation with maybe the ESA or another entity? What what, what oh, are some okay. expectation from a third party from your work? Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, no, basically, it was a uh, work on our own uh, as part of our university course on system engineering and, and operations. So, in collaboration with, with, of course, our supervisor, the professor uh, Lavagna of this course, but not with any agency or external uh, uh, entity. Okay, next question. Did you connect your Capella model to any PLM system for reuse of configuration control and manufacturing of parts for future mission? No, 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 we didn't uh, use any PLM systems and uh, uh, we just, uh, let's say, uh, used the main Capella features uh, in order to understand the basics of system engineering as the course uh, we attended was uh, an introduction to system engineering. So we just stayed with the, uh, let's say, basic uh, um, features of the software. Well, that's uh, all we have in the chat. Um, so I'm going to close the event for today. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, I'm going to bring you off stage.